Uh, thank you very much, uh, Patrick, and uh, I'm very glad to be here, and I'm very grateful to the Link Foundation, Tom, is here, and um, also to be with uh, old friends, um, Matt Rothschild, of course, from Progressive, with whom I worked in Washington decades ago. 35 years ago. Okay. And, um, of course, uh, uh, to the sociology department, uh, as well as the friends in the Center for Southeast Asian Studies, like Mike Cullinane and Al McCoy. I, um, I guess um, today I'll be speaking in the, on this uh, topic around the <coughs> conference, opportunities and constraints for progressive and liberal democracies. Um, tomorrow I'll be speaking on a much broader topic about what uh, 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 <coughs> some of the lessons that I've learned as a political activist uh, beyond the electoral arena, uh, presuming that I've learned some lessons, of course. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, begin. So um, for most of my life, I have been both uh, a sociologist and an activist. Um, after obtaining a PhD in sociology from Princeton in 1975, I plunged into full-time activism. First, as part of the movement to overthrow the Marcos dictatorship in the Philippines, then as a militant in the international movement against corporate-driven uh, globalization. I returned to academic life nearly 20 years later in 1994, uh, spending the next 15 years as a professor of sociology at the University of the Philippines in Diliman. In 2009, I became a legislator for a progressive political party in the House of Representatives uh, of the Philippines. Um, the progressive record of the party to which I belong, uh, Akbayan, or Citizens Action Party, was forged during its first decade of existence, 1998 to 2009, when it was for the most part in the opposition. In the legislative arena, the party's crusading spirit was expressed in a series of bills its representatives filed in Congress. Uh, pretty much have the same sort of legislative structure as the United States, the Senate as an upper house, and the House of Representatives as the lower house. Uh, the most prominent of these bills were the Reproductive Health Bill, and a bill to reinvigorate the foreign <coughs> agrarian reform effort. Bills to end discrimination against the LGBT community, institute appropriate land use, extend absentee voting rights to Filipinos overseas, promote security of tenure for workers, and introduce socialized housing to benefit the urban poor were among our other key legislative initiatives. Perhaps the crowning achievement of the party during this period of opposition was the passage of a bill extending the agrarian reform program, better known as CARFER, in 2009, an endeavor I participated in as a novice congressman. Akbayan played a central role in coordinating the legislative effort with mass actions on the ground, and it was this formula that eventually delivered uh, victory. <coughs> it was with this high-profile record of firmly pushing the people's agenda that the party held its fifth National Congress in 2009, when it took up the question of whether it would support the candidate for the 2010 presidential elections of the Liberal Party a traditional party with a mildly reformist image that is associated with what Al McCoy would call the, quote, patrician wing, unquote, of the Philippine elite. The debate <coughs> turned on whether the likely candidate could be relied on to carry out a reform program. It was clear to most members of Akbayan that while the Liberal Party candidate would most likely not have a left-wing program of wealth redistribution, participatory democracy, and defense of national sovereignty, there was a strong possibility that he or she would carry out a good governance or anti-corruption agenda. Given the horribly corrosive effects of corruption on our democracy, good governance was one of the people's overriding demands. And in Akbayan's view, being part of a reform coalition centered on seriously cleaning up government was a progressive move. But while the anti-corruption agenda was the decisive factor that led the party to support the Liberal Party candidate, 
we also had widespread expectations that he or she would be favorable to other parts of the Akbayan agenda, notably reproductive health and agrarian reform. In the period from 1998 to 2010, the controversial reproductive health bill, of which my party was one of the principal sponsors, had moved to the center of congressional debate. As for agrarian reform, there existed the recently passed Carper Law, awaiting implementation by a reform coalition in power. Moreover, we felt that as the coalition evolved, we would push the envelope to eventually gain support for other prongs of our party's reform agenda. These other items in the party's agenda were an independent foreign policy, especially in relation to the United States, repeal of the Automatic Appropriations Act, that made the primary item in the national budget the servicing of the foreign and domestic debt, and the elimination of neoliberal measures in trade, finance, and investment that exposed the local economy to the savage ravages of the global market. The Liberal Party, part, party candidate, Benigno Simeon Aquino, Aquino III, son of the iconic former President Corazon Aquino, and the martyr Benigno Aquino won the elections. Being the principal representative of Akbayan in the House, the next five years gave me an intense first-hand experience of the opportunities and constraints of coalition politics facing a progressive party that is a minor partner in a coalition dominated by liberals and traditional politicians. The following account discusses my party's experience in pushing three central advocacies as a participant in a governing coalition, reproductive health, agrarian reform, and good governance. The struggle for a government-supported family planning program to address both the issue of poverty and women's reproductive health has been one of the priorities of the progressive movement since the late 1990s. When the new administration came to power in 2010, uh, the RH bill, or Reproductive Health Bill, of which my party was one of the principal sponsors, had been on the legislative agenda for 12 years. The biggest block had been the powerful Roman Catholic Church. In the years leading up to the decisive battle in the 15th Congress, the pro-reproductive health or pro-RH forces had managed to circumvent this block in two ways. First, they built a multi-class alliance for family planning, reaching out not only to the poor and middle class, but to the elite as well. Undoubtedly, many in the elite swung around to the family planning side out of enlightened self-interest, meaning they saw a reduced birth rate among the lower classes as a way to ease popular pressures for redistribution. However, a not insignificant number, especially from the ranks of upper and middle class women, were won over by the argument that control <coughs> over childbearing and family size would lead to greater women's control over their lives. The second strategy deployed by the movement to outflank church opposition was to change the discourse. In the beginning of the parliamentary struggle over uh, reproductive health, the pro-family planning forces deployed the population control argument citing the Philippines' unsustainable 2.5% annual population growth. Against this, the bishops deployed the argument that artificial contraception was immoral because the only purpose of sex was to have children. I know this might sound a little bit antiquated, but it's, <laughs> it was very life and death issues in the Philippines over the last uh, uh, 20 years. This had, however, limited appeal, so they enlisted another argument, this one from the extreme left, that family planning was a tool promoted by the United States to keep third world populations down. Thus, we had the incongruous spectacle of upper class religious conservatives parading as anti-imperialists on the floor of the House of Representatives. <laughs> For a couple of years, armed with this bastard ideological formula, of anti-imperialism, quote-unquote, and anti-contraception. The alliance between the bishops, religious conservatives in the House, and the president blocked any movement on the legislative front, even as the rest of the country moved forward. 
Several factors broke the political stalemate in the 15th Congress from 2010 to 2013. One was the election of a president who actively supported the bill. But the decisive factor was the women's movement, which in the first decade of the 20th century reframed the issue as one of women's reproductive rights and health. Women had the right to space their children and determine how many children they uh, would have. Women had the right to protect their family's quality of life by limiting their offspring. Women had the right to family planning to preserve their health. It was a winning argument, one that was deployed with skill, not only at the rational level, but symbolically through the strategic dissemination of the image of an all-male hierarchy in a predominantly male Congress controlling women's choices. My party had been part of this process of reframing the discourse, and as a central participant in the heated debates during the 15th Congress, we reaped the benefits of a winning discourse. By 2012, some 14 years <coughs> after the RH bill was first introduced, the hierarchy and its allies in Congress were bereft of viable arguments and forced into pushing two related arguments that came across to the general public as outrageous or silly. One, that condoms and other contraceptives were what they called abortive fashions, unquote. And there was no conceptual or real difference between contraception and abortion. That was the second argument. The church's defeat was sealed though the bishops chose to go down fighting during the congressional debates in 2012 and 2013. It was a spectacular end to a long cultural war, though church-linked forces continued to hamstring full implementation of the law. The key lesson that I derive from this struggle is that even on burning cultural issues, progressives can register successes. In the reproductive health battle, we witnessed the success of a strategy of constructing broad alliances across classes and with the end in view of driving a wedge between a conservative ideological institution and the ruling elites and the middle class normally under its sway. Central to this strategy was an attractive human rights or gender rights discourse that promoted a self-image of being quote-unquote enlightened among elite and middle class supporters of the bill. Let me now move to legislative initiatives that bear directly on class issues. The limits to advocacies that cut deeply into class interests are illustrated by the battle over agrarian reform, one of the priorities of my party. Asia has been the site of four major successes in agrarian reform. China experienced revolutionary land reform during the 1950s and 60s. In Japan, the Allied occupation government under uh, Douglas MacArthur used land reform to destroy the land and elite that had served as a social base of militarism. South Korea and Taiwan saw reform from above carried out as a policy to preempt peasant insurgency. In contrast, despite the fact that land reform efforts extend back to the early 1960s, Land redistribution in the Philippines has been extremely slow, and the program has been condemned as a failure by critics both on the left and the right. The Marcos dictatorship had a land reform program in the early 70s, but this was placed on hold owing to landlord resistance. With the overthrow of the regime, a new ambitious effort was launched under the administration of President Corazon Aquino to redistribute some 10.3 million hectares of tenanted land. The period was a time of great ferment and undoubtedly a great impetus to the passage of the Comprehensive Agrarian Reform Program, or CARP, in 1988, was the rural insurgency led by the New People's Army. The law passed, but with many loopholes attached by a landlord-dominated Congress that practically limited land distribution to public land and left much private land untouched for the next two decades. With CARP in the doldrums, progressive and liberal elements in Congress were able to pass a new law extending agrarian reform and providing it with sufficient funds for land acquisition and support services and plugging many of the loopholes of the 1988 legislation. Two factors contributed to the passage in 2009 of CARPER, 
the extend, extended land reform road, of which my party was a principal sponsor and which I participated as a novice congressman. One reason or one factor was that the sitting president, Gloria Macapagal-Arroyo, apparently felt that supporting the bill was a way of getting lower class support to make up for the sharp erosion of her support among the middle class. Second, the movement for agrarian justice came to life, electrified by such event as the now legendary Sumilao More Farmers March, which saw a band of peasants advocating agrarian reform undertake a 1,700 kilometer march from the island of Mindanao to the presidential palace, about a thousand miles. Yet, one of the lessons of the agrarian reform campaign is that even if a unique conjuncture of events makes it possible to pass a strong law, absence of political will can prevent reform. In the last five years, when a reform coalition has been in power, this is exactly what happened. Presidential neglect and the lack of courage to confront the landlords on the part of the minister in charge of the reform resulted in over 700 hectares remaining and 700,000 hectares remaining undistributed by the end of the land acquisition uh, of the period of land acquisition and distribution on June 30, 2014. Most of these undistributed lands are private lands that constitute the best lands in the country. Pressure from my party forced the president to promise peasant representatives in a meeting in June 2012 that he would meet the deadline for land redistribution. When this had no discernible effect on the pace of reform, I publicly called for the Agrarian Reform Secretary's dismissal. The President ignored this, even as I became increasingly vocal about my opinion that the Secretary was one of the main ob obstacles to his keeping his promise to the peasants. The President's sheltering of this timid, incompetent official, along with his nonchalant attitude towards completing the program, was one of the factors that led to my resignation in March of this year. It should not have been surprising where his nonchalance was coming from because he belonged to the top agrarian landlord family in the countries, the Kohuancos and Aquinas. So this is where things are at this point. Agrarian reform has ground to a halt despite the existence of a powerful law to implement it, having been stymied by landlord resistance, presidential neglect, and bureaucratic timidity. I have reserved for last the party's experience in our advocacy for good governance. The promise that an administration led by the Liberal Party would be serious about reducing, if not eliminating, corruption was the main reason my party joined the Reform Coalition in 2010. Be it on the right, middle, or the left, no political party can refrain from placing good governance at the center of its electoral agenda since corruption is an issue that exercises all classes, the influential middle class most of all. Of course, anti-corruption can become a discourse that obfuscates the need for real structural reform. However, it is difficult, at least in a liberal democracy like the Philippines, to carry out real <coughs> structural reform if one is not perceived as not, be, is, is not, perceived, uh, as, uh, not being corrupt. It was on this issue of good governments that I, I eventually fell out with both the president and my party five years later, leading to my resignation as the party's senior legislator in the House of Representatives. A strong momentum for reform on the good governance front did mark the first years of the Aquino administration. As a principal representative of the party in Congress, it was exhilarating to be part of this reform push, the most critical thrust of which was the prosecution of the former president, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, for widespread corruption during her nine years in power. The high point of this effort remove, involved the removal of two of Arroyo's principal allies in 2011 and 2012. Via resignation under fire in the case of the ombudsman she had appointed and pre impeachment and conviction for culpable violation of the Constitution and betrayal of public trust in the case of the Supreme Court Justice that she installed in office shortly before her tenure ended. And in the impeachment proceedings, uh, my party took uh, a fairly active role. 
the elections of May 2013, three years ago, two years ago, yeah, oh, well, almost three years ago, were interpreted by many, including myself, as a vote of confidence in the administration. But the honeymoon with civil society did not last long. The cause of the discords, discord was a legacy of the American colonial period, the pork barrel, or the Priority Development Assistance Fund, a sum allocated by the chief executive to each senator and member of the House of Representatives. Over time, legislators had developed a sense of entitlement to the pork barrel at the same time that the executive had made use of it as a means of winning over and controlling members of Congress. I think that, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, uh, I, I don't think you're, you, the, the House of Representatives uh, now in the United States still has the pork barrel. I think this was abolished uh, decades ago, even before the war. But it remained one of the institutions that we inherited uh, from the Americans. Uh, and of course, the politicians had no interest in really uh, getting rid of it. After the elections of 2014, it came to light that a skilled political operative had set up fake organizations through which some legislators would channel funds meant for development projects and social services to themselves, with this operative taking a cut for her services. The result was a massive scandal that stoked popular revulsion. What came to be known as the Napoles scam, Napoles was the name of this operative, showed the pernicious ways the pork barrel was used by some legislators. However, instead of taking the lead and seeing the occasion as an opportunity to do away with a long controversial institution of uh, patronage, the president waffled initially defending it, then backtracking and abolishing it when public opinion became overwhelmingly in favor of its elimination. As for my party, its long position, its long-standing position on the pork barrel had been to call for its abolition in principle, but not until such a time that it could realistically be abolished to avail of it for projects benefiting the poor and the marginalized. The Napolis scandal made it clear to me that it was time for my party not only to call for the pork barrel's abolition in principle, but to put its principles on the line by refusing to avail of the sums allocated for the party by the executive. To my consternation, my proposal was roundly trounced during a leadership meeting. Little did I know that this was the first of a series of votes when I would find myself in the minority. A few days later, the president, sensitive to overwhelming public resentment, decided to abolish the pork barrel. Exasperated with the party's position, I told the party leadership that we had missed a golden opportunity to show that we were a party of principle. The president's hesitation when it came to abolishing the pork barrel became understandable when a multi-billion peso secret presidential slush fund called the Disbursement Acceleration Program came to light on the hills of the pork barrel scandal. The Disbursement Acceleration Program, or DAP, issue hit at the very center of the administration's good governance agenda. With the non-transparent, unaccountable, cavalier, and reckless manipulation of public <coughs> funds, the administration was engaged in the same sort of behavior that it accused the previous administration of. I had no doubt that the Supreme Court would rule the DAP unconstitutional. And we did declare three of the four modes of appropriation and spending as violating the charter. It was time, I felt, for the president to take decisive action to save his good governance platform. Being perceived as practicing double standards, using the good governance campaign to go after the administration's enemies, while protecting one's corrupt supporters and allies could be fatal to the coalition. During two leadership meetings of the party, I asked that the party demand that the president ask for the resignation of the secretary of the budget, a man named Florencio Abad, who was principally <coughs> responsible for concocting that. The majority disagreed with me, with some saying that the president was stubborn and to cross swords with him on the issue would simply make him even more stubborn. I said that this was fatalism 
not a stance worthy of a progressive party, and that it was the role of progressives to push the envelope for reform in coalition deliberations, even if this meant a steep uphill struggle. Getting nowhere with the party leadership, I decided to write the president directly as a concerned citizen. In that letter, I argued that the president had no choice but to fire the budget secretary since, quote, he committed a severe error of judgment in his liberal deployment and redeployment of funds appropriated for specific purposes by Congress. The congressional power of the purse is one of the key checks on the executive, and Secretary Abad should have had a sense that his fast and loose manipulation of funds with no sense of limits might have involved a violation of the principle of separation of powers. At the very least, his acts is mad of recklessness." Unquote. I find it hard to believe, the letter continued, quote, that Mr. Abad was unaware of the tremendous power the executive was acquiring over members of the Senate with the amounts ranging from 30 million to 100 million being given to each senator in addition <coughs> to the pork barrel that was still in existence then. This is precisely the kind of presidential patronage subversive of the separation of powers that the Constitution wanted to avert by specifying that the power of the purse belonged to Congress and the use of appropriated funds by the executive was to be strictly controlled by Congress." Unquote. This letter raised the tension within the Akbayan leadership to a higher pitch, with most members sharing the view that I have no right to write a president as an individual, that as, a that as the principal representative of the party in the public eye, my role was to reflect the party line, whatever were my individual views. Subordinating my views to the party position was the price, I was told, of being the party's most high-profile <coughs> representative. It was an argument that gave me pause, though I must admit I initially resisted its unassailable logic. It was now clear to me that the president would brook no criticism of his subordinates, and that this fraternity-like way of running the country exemplified all that was wrong with political governance in the Philippines. It was also clear that the party leadership would not speak to him on my behalf, perhaps out of fear of angering him further, losing influence with him, or even losing positions the party had obtained in the administration. In increasingly heated discussions, we in the minority reminded the majority that there were times that the party had to unambiguously choose its values over its interests, and that firmly standing up for good governance on the DAP issue, the AP issue, was one of those occasions. On January 25, 2015, the administration exper experienced its worst debacle, an anti-terrorist mission in Mindanao that went awry, resulting in the deaths of 44 members of the National Police Special Action Force, along with 18 militants of the separatist Moro Islamic Liberation Front, with which the government had negotiated a historic autonomy agreement that was awaiting congressional approval the Bangsamora Basic Law, or BBL. The Mama Pasano Raid, as it came to be called, was an undiluted debacle, a dagger plunge in the heart of the administration's good government's <coughs> agenda. It exemplified bad governance on three counts. First, the president refused to acknowledge command responsibility for an operation that he ordered that had gone awry, violating a basic tenet of presidential leadership. Second, he illegally placed in command of the operation a crony of his who had been suspended by the ombudsman. And third, he ordered a mission that was a priority of the United States, not the Philippines. And he knew he did this knowing full well that the mishap in the mission, which involved an incursion into the territory of the government's negotiating partner, the MILF, without clearing it with the insurgent group, would endanger the passage of the autonomy law, the Bank Samora Basic Law. In the name of the administration's good governance agenda, I demanded that the president take full responsibility for the fiasco and reveal all key dimensions of the raid, including the role of the United States. As the administration's crisis of authority mounted, I proposed to the party that we turn the debacle into an opportunity to push the envelope for reform. With the president in a weakened moral position, we should pressure him, I argued, not only to accept responsibility for the tragic raid, which the public was clamoring for, but also to shake up his cabinet by dismissing corrupt, inept, and reckless officials, among them 
the secretaries of the budget and agrarian reform. This would, I contended, reinvigorate the tattered good governance program. The party leadership refused, again, owing to concern that this would be counterproductive since it would do nothing but antagonize the president. More and more, it seemed to me that our disagreement no longer rested on differing assessments of the state of the coalition's program of reform. More and more, I was being driven to my biggest fear that the party's values and principles were becoming hostage to its interests, including the positions that our members occupied at various levels of government. The president's intransigence on the question of owning up to responsibility for the tragedy and his continued sheltering of corrupt and inept cronies led me to the realization that I could no longer support him. That meant I had to resign as the party's representative in the House of Representatives. For even as I was fully convinced that the party leadership was wrong in not backing me in demanding that the president live up to the principles of good governance by ceasing to shelter allies who had brought discredit to the good governance program, I had also come to accept that the leadership was correct in its position that one could no longer be the party's representative in Congress if he or she could not agree with a basic party position, such as its continuing support for the president. No one asked me to personally resign, but the party's code of conduct as a progressive party was clear. I had to go, and this I did on March 19 of this year. Let me then conclude. Throughout this narrative, I have highlighted various lessons I drew from the pursuit of three advocacies, reproductive health, agrarian reform, and good governance. The reproductive health struggle illustrated that cultural issues are an arena where the progressive agenda can be advanced to care for the alliance building and the control of the discursive battlefield. In the fight for fa family planning, the pro-RH forces were able to create splits in the upper and middle classes by substituting in place of the narrative of population control, control the discourse of women's reproductive rights, creating the space for the passage of the law in spite of the fanatical opposition of the powerful Catholic Church hierarchy. The second case study, agrarian reform, underlines that direct assaults, that direct assaults on the structures of inequality are the hardest to win in a non-revolutionary political struggle. The dynamic interaction of constraints and opportunities in such struggles is illustrated in the long push for agrarian reform in the Philippines. Despite the skill of progressive forces in taking advantage of political conjunctures and spaces to forge a powerful legislative act during a conservative period, the structures of agrarian inequality have remained strong owing to a combination of presidential neglect, bureaucratic timidity, and landlord resistance. The third case study on, struggle, on the struggle for good governance has a trove of rich lessons though it exacted per painful personal and political consequences. One lesson is that a coalition is dynamic, it evolves, and what might have been initially an alliance for reform may turn into something different. A second lesson is that a progressive party must continually assess its membership in such a coalition, weighing its interests against its values. It is but natural for a party to have interests, like positions in the administration, or influence within the coalition. But there may come a time when the maintenance of those interests might conflict with the party's fundamental values. At such critical junctures, a party of the left, if it is to maintain its integrity, must ensure that its values prevail. A third lesson is that while it is only to be expected that in the normal course of events, the party and its representatives in government have the same stance on issues that are relevant to its continuing participation in the coalition, there may arise occasions when despite the best efforts on both sides, there may develop serious, if not insurmountable, differences of opinion. At such points, a progressive in government was follow what her or his conscience tells her is right, even if it means opposing the leadership of the party. Let me just dwell on this point a bit more. Being a progressive has several dimensions. It means having a vision about how society should be organized, 
based on the values of equality, justice, solidarity, and sovereignty. It means having a political program to realize this vision. But it also means projecting an ethical, moral stance. And perhaps at a time that people have become so cynical about visions and programs, because words are cheap and because opportunism and corruption are so rife across the political spectrum, in my view, the distinguishing mark of a true progressive holding public office is his or her eth his or her ethical behavior. For me, being a progressive in the corridors of power means, above all, being steadfast in holding on to one's principles and values, even if this entails loss of one's position, if it entails loss of power. The deeper corruption that progressives are often susceptible begins when they sacrifice individual ethical behavior to the so-called quote-unquote higher interests of party, nation, or class. But can one really be a successful political reformer with such ethical standards? Let me cite one authority on this matter, a public intellectual whose politics are different from mine but one who did make a serious foray into electoral politics by running for president in his native Peru, the Nobel laureate for literature, Mario Vargas Llosa. And I quote, it's a long quote, but it's a good quote. Real politics, not the kind that one reads and writes about, but politics as lived and practiced day to day has little to do with ideas, values, and imagination, with teleological visions the ideal society we would like to create. And to put it bluntly, little to do with generosity, solidarity, and idealism. It consists almost exclusively of maneuvers, intrigues, plots, paranoias, betrayals, a great deal of calculation, no little cynicism, and every variety of con game. Because what really gets the professional politician, whether of the center, the left, or the right, moving, what excites him and keeps him going is power, attaining it, remaining in it, or returning to it as soon as possible. There are exceptions, of course, but they are just that, exceptions. Many politicians begin their careers impelled by altruistic sentiments, changing society, attaining justice, fostering development, bringing morality into public life. But along the way, in the petty pedestrian practice of day-to-day -day politics, these fine objectives become, little by little, mere cliches of the speeches and statements of the public persona they acquire, which in the end makes them all but indistinguishable from each other. What prevails in politicians is finally the gross and sometimes immeasurable appetite for power. Anyone who is not capable of feeling this obsessive, almost physical attraction to power finds it nearly impossible to be a successful politician. Is Vargas Llosa right that even for women and men of the left, an obsession for power is a necessity for success in electoral politics? Is ambivalence with power a massive obstacle to political success? Six years ago, I would have answered Vargas Llosa in the negative. I think I still would, though perhaps with less conviction than before. Thank you. So one of the uh, things you said near the end was that, um, first of all, thank you for a very interesting talk. I, I really appreciate Would you mind introducing yourself? Oh, well? OK. My, my name is uh, Ian Barrett. I'm a faculty member here at, uh, in geography. Um, so um, one of the things you said near the, near the end of uh, your presentation was that uh, one of the foundational ideals of uh, progressives is to support uh, the idea of sovereignty. You, and I'm, I, could you elaborate a bit on that in terms of what you mean by sovereignty and how you see that as a progressive uh, uh, cause? Well, um, you know, first of all, I think the you know in, in the concrete situation in the Philippines, which I think is very much similar to uh, the conditions of other, uh, let's call them developing or third world countries. Um, there's always been a very long history of uh, colonialism or neo-colonialism uh, or, you know, our neoliberal globalization that's been 
you know, pretty much imposed by the World Bank and the IMF. And so uh, I think basically uh, at this point, um, uh, an anti-neoliberal, uh, an anti-imperialist agenda uh, is, is, is something you know, that most progressive parties really have to carry. Uh, because, um, uh, for instance, in the case of the Philippines, again, uh, you know, a very strong <coughs> sort of the multilateral institutions um, and the corporations um, uh, go hand in hand with, you know, uh, a very uh, strong military presence. Uh, and in the case of the Philippines, in fact, we now have a situation whereby, although we kicked out the U.S. bases in 1992, we now have an agreement with the United States that practically converts the whole country into a military base, okay. uh, the Enhanced Defense Security Agreement. So, so <coughs> again, I, 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 I think it is inevitable. Uh, it, it, one can't be a progressive in a country like the Philippines, if in addition to democracy, justice, and equality, you do not include the idea or, or the, the, the idea of gaining uh, national sovereignty. And uh, so I, I would say that um, um, this is still uh, my sense. It would be you know, one of the acid tests of a true progressive. Uh, how one stands with respect to the IMF and the World Bank, to uh, global corporations, and to the United States uh, military presence. Paul Buell, uh, I guess I'd like to ask you the potential influences, progressive influences of Pope Francis, and whether there uh, is possible a revival of the kinds of influence that I think that liberation theology had in the Philippines at a previous time. Yes, um, um, it, it, this is a very good question. I think that um, liberation theology uh, in the 60s, uh, with the strong influence um, of um, the progressive theologians in Latin America, um, had a big impact in the Philippines. And I would say that uh, quite a, a lot of um, uh, priests and nuns and lay people who got impacted on by liberal liberation theology ended up joining the Communist Party, and in fact becoming part of the leadership of the Communist Party. Um, in the process of becoming uh, Marxists, uh, um, and you know not only Marxists but Maoists. Okay, uh, so um, so that's the first thing. Um, secondly. Um, uh, it, it's um, over the last several years. Um, I think that that, um, in terms of a driving force within the the Catholic Church, that has waned, uh, like it has in so many other places uh, around the world. Now, when Francis first became, uh, when when Francis became Pope. Uh, we were following this very closely because, as you know, the, the progressive priests in Argentina were quite skeptical that he was, in fact, uh, part of the liberation, a progressive. And um, there was this huge controversy about what his role was in, you know, those two Jesuits that were captured by the Argentine junta. Uh, with a lot of accusation that he had turned them over. <coughs> so, um, so that, a number of people, in fact, approached Francis um, first with a certain degree of skepticism. Um, now I think, um, he, especially after his visit to the Philippines, um, he's become, um, on social justice issues and economic justice issues, people think he, it's genuine. But um, when it comes to the issue of um, contraception, women's reproductive health, 
and um, 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 the uh, LGBT community uh, and uh, tolerance when it comes to that. I think that there is also a perception that he hasn't really moved, you know, when it comes to, you know, the question of um, uh, homosexuality and uh, the question of um, of uh, contraception. Uh, so, so the women's movement, especially in the Philippines, and the women's movement is very strong when it comes to the progressive movement. I think they're still of two minds about Francis. Um, but um, overall, I would say though that because he has put so much stress on social justice, and in fact, even come up with strong anti-capitalist statements, uh, I think that has, you know, that has the potential of again restarting uh, within the mainstream church in the Philippines, you know, very, uh, 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 you know, the, the sort of concerns. Uh, that that uh, were that found their flowering in uh, liberation theology. Yes, please. Hi, uh, from the uh, social media department. Uh, I'd like to push you more on the on the, on your answer about the connection of uh, progressivism with national sovereignty. And it seems to me that uh, on the left, in, in the first world, and in the global south. There's a, arisen this sort of notion that um, that signing a mutually binding treaty, far from being what was originally thought of as an exercise of national sovereignty, this is the kind of thing that sovereign nations do, as automatically an infringement of national sovereignty, right? And in, in the United States, the discourse is one where you see very often the right and the left uniting when you talk about uh, about international agreements that might actually bind the United States, right? And um, in, uh, among progressives here, there seems to be some general sort of differentiation, like uh, mutually binding economic agreements are somehow always bad, whereas mutually binding agreements uh, about strictly military policy may not be so bad. So, you know, it's good for the United States to be restrained from going to war by itself, but it's not somehow good for the United States to be restrained from engaging in potentially horrifically destructive economic policies like, for example, the agricultural subsidies or any of the number of things that, of course, you're extremely familiar with. So it seems to me that, that, uh, that there needs to be, to be more done to, to, to separate this. It, it is true that there are some treaties which were designed so that uh, that, that various countries are, you know, sort of signing on to a set of principles that are anti-human or against basic human needs, even those like the WTO, as you yourself have pointed out, still do provide different nations, even nations without power, with institutionalized means of some sort of equal access. So I'd like you to, to tell me, for example, what you think about what's the role of a progressive in the global south about in terms of supporting or opposing <coughs> mutually binding uh, international agreements on carbon emissions, that it would include actual limits on countries in the global south as well as in the north. Well, you know, you know, let's, you know when it comes to, I mean, if you're asking for my personal position on this, I, you know, I think that there are some, um, you know, there are some treaties that are so urgent at this point uh, you know, and, and a treaty on climate change is definitely one of them uh, that would um, uh, impose very strong restrictions uh, not only on the Annex I countries uh, but on the BRICS countries, for instance, China, India, um, Brazil, uh, you know, that have gone up there in terms of the, um, you know, uh, in terms of being very strong and powerful uh, emitters uh, of, of uh, carbon emitters, and uh, I, I think clearly when it comes to um, to, um, to what, what, when it comes to 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 a climate treaty, 
I would say that I would not be among those that would basically, that would say that, let's forget all about the intergovernmental process because it's so screwed up. Uh, and we're not going to, you know, let's just rely on civil society. I, I think that's a cop out. And unfortunately, uh, that's, that's, that's what's happening among many at this point as we go on to Paris. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I definitely would say that, you know, there are certain uh, treaties, you know, and, you know, that uh, need to be really negotiated. Uh, and um, that we really have to make sure that those treaties have teeth um, and uh, do not simply uh, provide, uh, you know, uh, uh, some sort of legitimation for uh, powerful forces, uh, like, for instance, China and the United States, uh, which, uh, you know, I think everybody, my, my sense at this point is that it's, it's pretty useless uh, to talk simply about um, shackling the Annex One countries at this point in time. I mean, if you, you know, they have to be shackled, but you also have to shackle the, uh, you know, the, the, the upcoming big polluters, you know. And, and, and unfortunately, of course, uh, among uh, certain organizations, I will not mention names, that come from a, the so-called north-south uh, uh, polarization that um, existed back in the 1980s, even up to the 1990s. Um, you know, what China does, for instance, or what India does, um, shouldn't worry too much about it. The important thing is to get the United States uh, and to get the European countries uh, to be the targets of uh, any binding treaty. So that. That, I think, I, I, I would certainly disagree with that. Would you mind, we're talking about Paris, what organization you're referring to? <laughs> I would prefer to tell it to you okay. in private. I, I just don't want to exacerbate certain, sure. certain disagreements that we've had with certain uh, organizations that I don't think are fulfilling a good international political role at this point in time. When you say that the decline on the left of any discourse in support of internationalism has now made it more difficult to push for the kinds of results that you, that you want? Well, I, I, um, I think that um, if you ask me, I think that in terms of the broad progressive movement and broad civil society movement, I, you know, I, I, I try to follow these things, but I, I think they are for you know, if, you know, that they would not be for a binding treaty that would let the BRICS go. Uh, now, where it, when it comes to the traditional left that, from the 1980s and 1990s, um, or the left that was the developmentalist left that basically said, um, you know, developing countries can do no wrong even if they're massively emitting uh, uh, pollutants, um, I, I think that that is a stream of, of that, 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 is a, that, that is a sort of, uh, that is a position that I think has been overtaken by, by this broader civil society consensus that, that there has to be um, binding um, uh, uh, binding uh, agreements uh, on all the key actors that are polluting, uh, that are creating such heavy um, uh, climate pollution. Um, that's my sense. I think when I talk about the when I talk about the um, the disillusionment, it's disillusionment with the na with national governments as a whole with the state participants in the negotiations that they haven't come to any agreement. It's more of that, it's more of that, you know, the states can't do it. They're so stupid. They're so, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're really that thinking about the interests of the planet, but just thinking of their own elite interests that, that, that civil society now has to go with alone. Uh, it's, that's, 
more of the that's more of the um, the the disillusionment that I think is arising as we come to Paris. And I think that much as I can understand that, I, I think that's not a good position to take. I, I think that even leading up to Paris, we really need to pressure China, the United States, and all the big polluters, uh, you know, and all the Annex One countries to really come to binding uh, uh, limits. And um, so, I, I think I've laid this out in some of the things that I've written because, you know, one of the things that, of course, the U.S. and China have done is they've, they've come to their own agreement precisely because they, they, they want to avoid uh, anything that comes out of Paris, and it was like pulling the rug from under there. So that's one big thing that we really need to struggle with. But having said that, I, I do think that there are, you know, there are agreements that are so asymmetrical whether bilateral or multilateral, that the only thing to do is to really fight, find ways to be able to uh, define these agreements. And I think uh, the, the World Trade Organization you know, was, was clearly, for me, an extremely asymmetrical agreement. And I think the combination of developing countries and civil society that worked it out through Seattle, through Cancun, etc., to define the WTO, or at least Killed the Doha Round. Uh, I think that was that was a very good movement, you know, that did uh, uh, that that did um, prevent the WTO from becoming the principal engine of um, corporate-driven globalization. Uh, of course, what the big countries did then was they began to move towards uh, um, bilateral uh, agreements, which are even more asymmetrical. <laughs> you know, so, but. That's you know, but but I guess my point is that there are multilateral agreements that you know are absolutely necessary, and there are multilateral and bilateral agreements that are so asymmetrical, you know, that they have to be struggled against. And what I was talking about when when it came to the Philippines uh, was um, um, the recent enhanced defense cooperation agreement. As the United States now is as as as. President Obama has been trying to do is to try to get the U.S. from this um, the way that it's been uh, bogged down in the Middle East and to a more an area of more um, conventional kind of deployments where it thinks that it has you know it, which it is more uh, adapted to, uh, which is the containment of China and you know the Philippines was a central part of the picture. And this enhanced defense cooperation agreement that basically, for all intents and purposes, makes the Philippine, the whole Philippines a big military base to which US troops can come and go, um, uh, is, uh, and practically all the US bases, the former US bases plus Philippine bases now are open to uh, US deployments, uh, all in the interests of uh, containing China. Uh, and uh, you know this 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 sort of um, the violation of, of 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 national sovereignty uh, you know is so blatant uh, at this point that uh, this is this is this is one of the things that uh, the progressive movement has really to come to terms with uh, in in I mean in, in terms of really building up the opposition to this sort of uh, remilitarization of the Philippines. Um, which is now accompanying the remilitarization of Japan, <laughs> and you know, basically, basically making that whole area very, very strong. You know, there's the possibilities for conflicts have really heightened in that area, and they've been, you know, these are treaties uh, that uh, these countries have engaged in. Yes. yes. Um, from the perspective of being inside the imperial power that you just mentioned. As, as an activist, my, well, my name is Ann Fleischley. I'm a longtime lawyer in town and a journalist. I look at it from this perspective. We lack the sovereignty that you, as a people, we in the United States, lack the sovereignty that you have listed as a major attribute of the progressive um, goals. I would ask you uh, this question. Um, what do you con 
think of this as an activist position, that we should be calling ourselves the 99%. I mean, that worked at one time a few years ago. And what it does is it separates out the people as a sovereign concept of the 99%. What do you think that, uh, think of that as a strategy to try to gnaw away at the interior organs of this particular imperial um, power that we're, we're, we're having to deal with every day in every city and every, everybody's life here is now very badly affected by <coughs> the imperial power that your nation feels. So what do you think? Well, I'm, I'm always in support of that, of course. Uh, and I, I do think that the interests of the corporate elite in this country, the 1%, really are not the interests of the vast majority of the people whose like, the standards of living have, uh, have declined. But again, my question, though, is how does one concretely organize here to, to be able to get a critical mass of the 99% uh, to move away from, you know, the the imprisonment in the you know in the Republican Democratic uh, two-party politics that uh, has been very much. Um, subverted uh, by corporate power so that, as you all very well know, sometimes the Democratic and the Republican um, uh, <coughs> parties, you know, you know, oftentimes have, you know, are both very much susceptible to interest from Wall Street. And I mean, as, as you all know, <laughs> you know, um, Bill Clinton was, he, you know, a lot of the neoliberal measures uh, came under the Clinton administration. <coughs> and I think Wall Street has been very much connected by a Rubin and company to Wall Street. And so, what is my, if you, to, if you were to ask me what is the, yeah. what do I support as a strategy here, I think maybe an initial step to support Bernie Sanders. Certainly, Sanders has excited the political imagination of progressives in the Philippines. And uh, much as we, you know, we, uh, we of course know the, the difficulties of getting him elected, uh, uh, nevertheless, I think that he enjoys a great deal of support from uh, the progressive movement in the country. I mean, uh, they're just getting to know him at this point in time. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yes, please. So, so I have two questions. One's really straightforward and the other's not. Um, but the first question, I actually don't know anything about the American system. I mean, the, the term pork barrel in the U.S. in my lifetime has been used a little bit differently. So could you say a little bit about what that program was <coughs> in the U.S.? I, I, or in the Philippines? I, I just have no idea. Well, okay, in the Philippines, it's, uh, it's um, you know, the president, you know, has the, used to have the right to allocate, you know, a certain amount uh, to members of Congress. Um, to be spent in the district? No, it was uh, to be spent according to the way they wanted it spent, you know, uh, basically with hardly any controls, you know, like, for the Philippine House of Representatives, it was 70 million uh, 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 pesos a year, okay? And uh, for senators, it was 200 uh, million. 70 million uh, pesos is uh, almost uh, 2 million dollars, right? And that was basically unregulated, practically unregulated. Of course, there were all sorts of formal measures that it had to you know, it had to, uh, it had to follow certain restrictions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But pretty much, members of Congress were able to move around those things. So that was the, that was the, that was the, the what was called the, uh, you know, the, the pork barrel in the Philippines, uh, the Priority Development Assistance Fund, uh, 
and um, it had come under severe criticism from political reformers for so many years, you know, that it, it was a tool of presidential politics that basically um, um, giving you or withholding your pork barrel, especially under the previous administration, became a means by which uh, members of Congress, senators and congressmen, were basically used to push the agenda uh, of the administration. Now, now, from what I can gather is that that came to us through the U.S. Uh, system um, back uh, in the pre-war days. I, I, I think that I'm not exactly sure when the pork barrel got, um, got uh, eliminated in the States, but in the early decades of the Republic, you did have this mesh, this, this funds that the presidents um, had the authority to be able to parcel out among members of Congress. Uh, but that has been abolished in, 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 in the American system. But it, uh, it, it, it persisted until uh, 2013 in the Philippines. And as you can see, it was a very, very strong, uh, it, it was a very, very uh, powerful tool uh, by which the president could keep members of Congress in line. So that whoever was president, um, whatever the initial configuration of Congress when he got, when he, when he sat, um, um, when he first came to power, uh, he or she would be able to, using the pork barrel, among other things, uh, would inevitably always be able to create a majority that would support uh, his or her agenda. Um, oftentimes, which was you know, not so much a programmatic agenda, but just you know, a, a very financial agenda. So the other question I had, I'm sorry, kind of. So I just want to oh, follow ahead. up on that. I, mean, I would argue, um, my name's Alan Ruff. Yeah. Um, I would argue that pork barrels have never been abolished in the States. Okay. <laughs> it, been, it, it, it may be how it really works. Yeah, yeah. It, it's actually been restructured. Yeah, right. So much of it comes through, for instance, Pentagon spending uh, to districts. Um, yeah. Even here in, in the good state of Wisconsin, the good progressive uh, Democrat, now retired uh, David Obi, would battle like hell to get contracts for shipbuilding in, in, in northern Wisconsin. And uh, the horse trading that comes along with that pork barrel that, that all those massive amounts of money for air, for bases, you know, there's just one part of it, for military bases, for weapons contracts. For bridges. Uh, for you know every, sorry? Bridges. Yeah, for every, you know, you name it. It's, yes. uh, it's based upon uh, winning contracts for constituencies at home in order to assure re-election and so on and so forth. That's a very, very, very essential part of the American political process still. Yeah. Right, I, 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 I have no argument with this. All I'm trying, uh, I guess what my question to you was that that's, um, where does that negotiation take place? It does, it, that takes place within Congress itself. Sure, sure. It can. Where they, lobbying, the, the lobbying, lobbying does, right? Yeah. But yeah. you don't have, you know, uh, you don't have a, you don't have, committees. okay, you don't have a presidential fund that basically, no would be a source of control on the part of the president to give you. I guess that's the pork barrel we're talking about. At least there's a bridge built into this system. I mean, the way you describe it, it's just bribery, you know? I mean, it's... Well, it was institutionalized bribery. Yes. yes. There's other forms of distribution of funds. So some members of Congress who are re-elected easily, but nonetheless gather lots of contrib financial contributions, and they have big war chests. They, like Nancy Pelosi, for example, she'll dole out that money to other members of Congress mm -hmm. okay. to keep them in line right. and to get, gain favor with them and maintain her position. So that, that phenomenon happens. But it's all legal. Okay, yeah. Right. Well, it used to be. The pork barrel was also legal in the Philippines. That, you know, that, but it was an instrument of presidential control. Patrick, it's presidential control. So we're talking about different pork barrels here, but pork barrels both, nonetheless. And we still throw around that term today. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, do you, 
Did you have well, to I, I, think, I agree with you. I mean, basically, for me, the Americans established a system whereby through partisan politics, one could manipulate government funds, which we called pork barrel, you know, through various people who were in line with the presidential candidate or the person who held the, the, the palace. Whereas the kind you're talking about is more almost a discretionary kind yes. that comes to the president that he can distribute. And that was actually more post-war. You know, I think that was a, 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 almost an invention of the Philippine Republic rather than the American colonial period. The American colonial period had a very definite pork barrel politics, but it wasn't more of a discretionary kind. It was more how you spend money in districts. You know, and who gets to build the school, the road, the bridge, the, the you know, right. the fish you know, and, yeah. and that was very loaded with partisan politics, and we also called that pork barrel. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, so this might be my second question. Well, I don't know, but there are a lot of, so in the U.S. they've now made it very difficult for individual congressmen to lobby for a bridge in their district, and that's called pork barrel spending, and it's been made almost, I think it's actually been made kind of unacceptable. And one of the effects has been to make partisan lines much harder, and it's much harder to build any kind of consensus, because one of the ways that presidents would buy off, or majority parties would buy off opposition would be to offer a bridge in your district or a school. And, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure where the line between good governance and democratic consensus building is, but I always worry about, you know, there are ways in which representatives need to do stuff in their district, and if that's what you're describing, you know, maybe this is a corrupt version of it, maybe you need to clean it up. 